Thank you all for, for being uh, uh, still here with you. I, I wanted to uh, uh, really uh, thank you all for, uh, for uh, coming to, uh, to, uh, to lose for those of you who are not here uh, on, on, the, on the ground here with us. Uh, uh, so thank you for uh, having uh, gone through a lot of uh, adversarial uh, uh, events and, uh, and uh, manifestation. And I, I wanted to uh, really thank you for participating in this uh, event that, uh, that is very dear to us. Uh, this uh, inauguration of the of the new TSC uh, Sustainable Finance Center. I, I would like also to, to thank very much uh, Sophie Moanas, who has uh, uh, been uh, very instrumental in uh, in putting together the program, uh, along with uh, with a lot of people who I'm see. Uh, I see Catherine Casamata, Patrick Feve, Milo Bianchi has also uh, um, uh, been uh, very uh, um, uh, active in preparing the conference. Also, Christophe, I don't see uh, Christophe Bizier, but also thank you very much for, uh, for uh, uh, making sure that this event was, uh, was a great, uh, both uh, um, uh, from a scientific and, 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 uh, and a personal point of view. So thank you in particular to Sophie and, and all of you. And I wanted also to, to thank very much um, um, uh, the, uh, the staff who has uh, helped us in doing a lot of operational risk management and reorganizing, reshuffling a lot of things. So I'm thinking about uh, Valérie Placier, uh, Priyanka Talim, and Stéphanie Risser, who, who are not here, but uh, I think we can also applaud them. <laughs> and so, so we are here uh, for this uh, last session uh, of, of the conference, uh, which is a round table on, on uh, new risks and, and new challenges. So it's very open. So uh, we are going to have, a, I hope, an interesting uh, discussion. And, and I guess uh, um, uh, our uh, um, uh, participants, uh, whom I'm, I'm going to present, uh, we will we'll, uh, focus around the, uh, the new risks related to, uh, to uh, climate change in particular. And, uh, and um, we are very happy to have, uh, so today with us, uh, Kera Benami. Kera Benami is the Deputy Head of Analysis, Financial Stability and Risk uh, Division at the AMF, the French uh, Financial Market uh, Regulator. Uh, so she began her career at the French Ministry and then she moved to AMF. Uh, um, and, and now, so she is in the Policy and International Affairs uh, Directorate. And, uh, um, and she's, uh, she has been... Um, she has been working a lot, in particular, in market microstructure issues. So you, 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 you were uh, very, uh, very much aware of a lot of things that we discussed about uh, high frequency trading, and uh, uh, and so um, uh, for those of you who do not know that, uh, Kera Benami is a former PhD student of Toulouse, and so we are very proud uh, that uh, she's now uh, at the regulator, uh, trying to help to have order orderly uh, markets, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and protect investors. Uh, and protect investors yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Kera, for, for being here on the on the on the round table. Uh, so, so we also have the pleasure to have Guillaume uh, Levanier, who is uh, uh, currently um, deputy head of uh, gr uh, group investment uh, of the group investment office at at Score, which is um, a reinsurance company, and he's in charge of the uh, sustainable investment policy. Uh, he used to, uh, to be, uh, for several years, the advisor to the CEO, Denis Kessler, and, um, and he's also uh, currently uh, maître de conférence at, uh, in econometrics at Sciences Po. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much uh, to you, Guillaume, for, 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 uh, for being here with us. And we also have the pleasure to have on the, on the, on the round table Christian Gaulier, who is professor of economics here uh, in, uh, in Toulouse, a specialist of long-term investments and, and asset pricing. Uh, in particular uh, related to climate uh, climate issues. So uh, I think we are going to have a very uh, um, uh, uh, interesting uh, roundtable. And so the way we are going to organize uh, the roundtable is that our uh, uh, two uh, speakers from the uh, from uh, practice will, uh, will start presenting a few thoughts about uh, this theme. And then after Christian will react and then the floor will be open for you to, to try to uh, enrich the discussion if, if, uh, if needed. Okay. Okay, so Kira, let me try to help you. Sorry. So, uh, hello, everybody. So, thank you very much for having invited me as 
stated by Sebastian, I'm very glad to be here today, given uh, that this is the university where I learned almost everything I can rely on to do my job today. So um, I am here today to talk about sustainable finance and to try to map uh, where, uh, as a regulator, we stand and what's next, what's next to be happened. So sustainable finance is the incorporation of economical, uh, sorry, environmental, sorry, social and governance, so the famous ESG principles, into business decisions and investment strategies. So it covers many issues from climate and pollution to labor practices or consumer privacy. It is not new in finance, but it has accelerated in recent years and is radically reshaping the finance industry and its relationships to, with its environment. Climate change features prominently among ESG issues. As the awareness of the way it, might, it, it is impacting, affecting financial markets and even fi financial stability is growing. So this could be achieved um, not only through um, a physical risk, with an increase of frequency and severity of uh, um, natural disasters, but also through a transition risks that might stem from a disorderly transition to a low carbon economy. So uh, Guillaume will enter into more details uh, with respect to how they deal with this risk. And this last risk is particularly challenges and show the role uh, that uh, the financial market has to play. First, um, through the amounts of uh, the humans that are needed to finance the transition uh, of our economies. Um, and in this way, the financial system has a key role to play. But also uh, by the fact that uh, we are already experiencing a, shift a shifting mindset from the industry, but also from investors, towards considering sustainable uh, finance in their investment decisions. So there is a strong momentum to make progress and, to, uh, and there are also a lot of expectations from all stakeholders. And these expectations rely on financial regulators as it is in its core missions to protect investors and maintain orderly markets. So how to do that? We can do that by two ways, guiding and protecting. These are the two main area of actions where uh, the regulator can help. Uh, it can help support and encourage the move towards a more sustainable model. So um, what we have observed is that despite a lot of initiatives, there is still a lot to do and the regulator has a role to play. So how? By guiding and, assi and assisting firms, so helping them to adapt, their, uh, to adopt best practices and develop their framework to uh, facilitate innovation, that will have a major role in the transition phase. And by protecting investors uh, and maintaining investment in the financial systems, so this implies supervising the effectiveness and the quality of information disclosed to, un to investors and avoid any attempt of greenwashing. And lastly, to develop and contribute to the European and international debate on this field. Uh, to collectively try to build a robust and an ambitious framework in line with the European uh, Commission action plans. And this is where I go now, because um, in, in March 2018, the Commission published a very ambitious action plan with uh, one of the four pillars uh, of the EU strategy to achieve the uh, 2050 carbon neutrality uh, target, uh, has already resulted in the adoption of several texts. So what are the objectives of, of the Commission? The objective is to refocus capital flows uh, towards more uh, sustainable investment, but also to manage fina financial risks and, of course, to promote transparency. Uh, it has declined this uh, action plan into 10 main focus areas that are uh, exposed here. So the idea is to uh, foster the responsibility of fund managers and investors, uh, the reporting of companies, and encourage supply and demand for sustainable products. So there have been several texts that have already been adopted and are, some of them are still uh, under discussion, but you have the uh, benchmark uh, regulation, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, creates 
uh, two new uh, categories of low carbon benchmarks uh, and a new category of benchmarks that allows to align um, the uh, portfolio within the Paris target agreement. Sorry, this one. Okay. And that strengthened the disclosure requirements uh, for all benchmarks with the integration of ESG uh, factors in their methodology. You also have the uh, disclosure regulation, which has been, which is a very complex text, and which has introduced a core concepts such as the sustainability, sustainability risk, and the uh, fact that you have to evaluate the potential negative impact on the value of the investment due to an adverse ESG impact. So there are two levels of disclosure, not only at the entity level, but also at the product level. This can be, pre uh, this can be done uh, at the pre-contractual phase, or you can have also periodic reports and information that is published on the website. And then the last text, which is still uh, under um, discussion, uh, which is under Trilogue at the commission level, is the taxonomy te text, which, is, which proposed an harmon harmonized criteria to determine whether an, eco an, ac an economic activity is environmentally sustainable or not. So having said that, oops, so, the, um, the sustainable finance is one of the priority of, uh, of the IMF, which has uh, largely uh, contributed to the work. Uh, it is fully supportive of the uh, Commission's action plans, and um, the sustainable finance part is, is, is a key pillar of its strategic visions. So once again, through guiding and protecting investors, uh, bringing consistency and ensuring readability. So, of course, there are plenty of efforts to, to be done still regarding um, completing the, the regulatory framework or um, identifying remaining issues such as, such as reporting standards, data providers, or uh, rating agent, agents. Thank you. Um, thank you, Celestino. Thank you for being here. Um, SCO, the company I work for, is the fourth global reinsurance company. And for those who don't know uh, the reinsurance business, it's very easy. We, we insure mainly against uh, major climate events, such as floods, tornado, tornadoes, uh, massive wildfires, and else. Um, we also insure against uh, pandemics and other la large losses, events at a global scale. Um, for these reasons, the risks and the climate risks um, affect in our assets intangibly and uh, tangibly um, also. So there are, there are material on our business with the, with the P&L, um, and they also affect our balance sheet on the asset and the liabilities through um, underwriting and through uh, the investments. Uh, thus, we have a double impact on, um, on, on climate, and we also have a double impact on climate change um, on our balance sheet. If you now focus on um, on this slide, and um, just to, <laughs> to to take the same words as, as you, we have two mainly um, we have a, a big difference between uh, physical risks and transmission risks. And I think this slide and this uh, um, this curve illustrates um, the, the main difference between them. Um, actually, we we define in uh, in finance in sustainable finance since 2015 and since. Uh, the speech from uh, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney, um, climate change risks as the addition of two different risks. The first, uh, the physical ones, that are um, the risk of a potential economic loss and financial losses uh, caused by climate-related uh, hazards. So basically, uh, climate change risks are, uh, can be acute hazards or chronic hazards, such as uh, new floods, new sea level rises and, and else. Well, the, whereas the transition risks are more, are much more the, uh, the risk associated to the economic dislocation and financial losses associated with the process of adjusting toward a low carbon economy. So for example, um, if tomorrow France or Europe decides to, to withdraw all the, uh, the, the pits and offshore 
um, oil pits around uh, around Europe, then we, you will have to uh, to to strand assets and um, and to, to 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 have new values of uh, of assets uh, that will be stranded. And you, you can see that uh, if you if you have higher transition risks, meaning if you take actions just to, to curb the, the GAG emissions, then you will have less physical risks. And the other way, if you don't do anything against climate and you don't have any transition risk, then you will have higher physical risks. Just to, just to show you that actually pricing assets in a climate change um, scenario, well, you have to define the scenario you're heading to. Uh, are you going to a two degree scenario? Are you going to a six degree scenario? And um, and pricing assets depends on the scenario you are taking. And then you will have either more physical risks or transition risks. Um, this way, how do we act uh, in uh, as asset owners and asset managers? We have different um, levels of taking actions um, at the asset management uh, uh, on the asset management per perspective. Either, and this is the first line, you do traditional uh, investing, and then you only uh, focus on financial returns, or you take into account your um, the impacts of climate on your portfolio, which means you, you become resilient. Or if you go a, a, level, um, a level down, you, you can also take into account the impacts of your portfolios on the, um, um, on, on the environment. And if you go down and down and down, you, you can, the, the, the last, uh, the, the final, uh, investment focus would be in the impact one uh, with, a, with a focus not only on financial returns but also on the environment and then it would it would uh, put a, um, a trade-off between financial returns and, uh, and environmental returns so this is the the main chronology of um, of all the asset managers some of them are still at the traditional level 99 percent I think and uh, the more you take in, into account climate, the more uh, you have to make trade-offs between uh, financial returns and, fin and non-financial returns, and the more you go to impact investing. Um, so, yeah, so this slide shows uh, what um, a traditional investor could, um, could do today. So this example uh, is from SCORE, um, the, uh, but I, I will We'll say it more um, after. So for, for our business, we take into account the outside in. So the second, uh, uh, the second line I was showing to you, the, the resiliency, meaning that we, um, we take into account the, the, the coal, the oil sands, all the articles, and all these uh, assets that could be stranded if a tra transition risk uh, would be higher. But we also take into account the carbon footprint of our <coughs> of our portfolio so um, <coughs> we try to have an, an approach of taking uh, taking into account um, these um, these two levels either the outside in or the outside inside out and to, to manage it uh, within the portfolio and last uh, last slide yeah, I just wanted to show you this slide, which is, uh, I think, our best example of taking taking into account uh, the um, the transition risk. Actually, we performed an analysis on all our portfolio and try to see which asset were um, at risk. So we uh, we pay, we took uh, eighty five percent of the portfolio and. Um, we wondered, depending on the sector, or depending on the industry, well, um, sub-industry, or depending on the um, the company, which one could be stressed if um, there were uh, the, if there was a new regulation uh, with a, a probability um, just to withdraw this business. 
So we can see just both um, that the green the green uh, shows uh, when there is no no risk of withdrawal, then there is a moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. And we we're trying uh, uh, in the asset management side to, um, to monitor this exposure just to diminish well to to have it low uh, on the portfolio. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for, for this uh, uh, insight. So, uh, Christian, would you like to, uh, to, to uh, add some, uh, some insights or, or to comment sure. maybe, or ask questions? Or... Sure, I would, I would be very happy to do that. How much time do I have? Okay. Uh, <laughs> now I'm okay. Five, uh, ten minutes. Okay. Then after we can have a. Uh, yeah, well, let me say first, uh, I'm sorry I was not able to attend the, the conference. Uh, this afternoon, I was in Monaco for, uh, for a green finance event there, uh, trying to have some impact of uh, billionaires. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by what happened over the last few years, in particular the last few year, few months and the few the last few days. In fact, uh, I mean, it seems to be there is just an enormous tsunami of. Uh, of public pressure, and political pressure from financial market to do something for climate change. Uh, and and I'm, I'm witnessing... Following the publication of Yes, uh, advertisement. Uh, um, uh, you may be interested to read my book, Le Climat <laughs> Après la Fin du Mois. <laughs> um, uh, that talks about all those issues. So, so what is fascinating is, uh, you know, the solution for uh, solving climate change is not is not uh, finance. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's the power of states to put a price on carbon. We we know as economists that to find in order to find an externality, the solution is the, pre the polluter pay principle, uh, the Pigovian tax, uh, and price just price the externality and impose this price universally to the markets, and the markets will solve the problem by themselves. And uh, uh, we have we have been saying that for uh, 20 years. Uh, we know we have a climate change problem for at least 30 years, and nothing happened. And so now, government and people tend say, okay, plan, plan A do, did not work, let us try plan B. And plan B is this green, green finance uh, uh, movement. Uh, I'm skeptical. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. So f first, this investment movement um, is problematic because, you know, we, we already have uh, carbon leakage. Uh, when, when one country decided to put a price on carbon, we know that uh, there, is, there will be little impact because most uh, emitting industry will just move on the other side of the frontier. Uh, they will dismantle the, the plant and they will rebuild the plant on the other side of the, of the border. Um, for, for finance, it's this, this carbon leakage is 10 times larger. I mean, we know capital is very mobile. I mean, physical capital is not too mobile, but, but financial capital is, is, is completely mobile at no cost. So, so when, when one bank decides to invest, two banks decide to invest. Uh, so so you, you, your impact is, the impact of this investment is likely to be relatively marginal. Think about the tobacco industry. Okay, tobacco industry, we, there has been in the 80s a big movement of disinvestment. Is that has it been that useful? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably it has a marginal effect on the cost of capital of the, capi the tobacco industry, but mostly the, I mean, the, main, the main impact was uh, putting a tax on, 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 tobac on tobacco products. And that's what happened, and uh, we have seen uh, some success in that. So same thing for climate change. So that's that's one one first thing. So so I'm 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 sympathetic to uh, all the, those efforts of uh, central bankers, banks, insurers to try to to answer to this uh, public pressure to for them to do something. But uh, you, we should recognize that uh, their 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 ability to do something is quite limited. I mean it's, that's I think it's something important to say. Um, yeah, 
So if I if I go back to after all this uh, this uh, roundtable is about new risk and new challenges, uh, let us go back to the uh, to Plan A. Okay. Uh, so that is suppose that tomorrow we will have some uh, public efforts, uh, coalition of government deciding to punish brown industries, and eventually they just assume that they will become uh, the government will become serious about. I'm, I, I'm not sure that will happen. Uh, we know that uh, we have the free riding problem, and, and we don't know to solve that. But uh, let us let us let us hope that that will happen, and then we will have those strand data sets. Uh, keep in mind, if we put a price on carbon around 30, 35, 30 euros per ton of CO2, coal is dead. Right? Coal will be replaced by by gas, natural gas in Europe. Right? Not, uh, producing electricity with gas, with natural gas, is a little bit more, more expensive than producing electricity with, with, uh, with coal. But if you put a price on carbon uh, at around, I mean, let me say, 40 euros per ton of CO2, coal will be dead and will be replaced by natural gas, at, as it is currently the case in the US, uh, but not because of carbon tax, but because uh, natural gas is cheaper than coal. Uh, due to the shale gas uh, wave, so uh, so so meaning the coal industry will be a stranded asset at least in Europe. So and, and of course you know banks and comp and, and insurers uh, and, and and hedge fund and you know all those uh, players on the financial industry should, should realize that and that should be taken into account in their investment strategy. Uh, so that's that's one good thing, uh, and it's important to for financial market for, so for regulators to say that. I'm not sure that the financial market did not is, are not is not aware of that already, and, and there have been some papers explaining that there, it's already the, the case that that asset prices already contain uh, a carbon risk. Okay, so so. Why do we need the regulation? For example, there is this idea to impose climate uh, stress test. Why do we need specifically uh, target this specific factor of risk, uh, not the others? I mean, uh, I believe that most uh, investors know that there is a risk that one day uh, the European Union will increase the price of carbon on the, on the EU ETS. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so if we are serious on plan of on, on plan A, it's not 40 euros that we would, we should put put on the on the price of carbon. It must be something like 200, 300, 400 euros per ton of CO2. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not only coal that we will have to remove from the electricity mix. It will be also gas and oil. I mean, oil is already out for most of uh, European countries, uh, but it will be also gas. And, and, and to remove gas from the electricity mix, that will be much more problematic because currently the wind uh, technology and the photovoltaic technologies is not, uh, is not profitable compared to gas. Uh, so that's a difficulty. It's fascinating to see also this. Uh, you mentioned mentioned the problem of uh, you know the tax the European uh, com European Commission taxonomy. Uh, so it's something that is uh, quite fascinating to uh, to witness. I mean, this is the idea that the political system will say to the financial industry, well, uh, this is green and this is wrong. It's uh, it's a taxonomy. It's uh, zero one. Uh, it's completely Manichaean. Um, and that's crazy. Right? So currently, the debate, uh, so the, the taxonomy is not yet finished because yeah, there is a big debate about whether the nuclear industry, uh, the nuclear technology, is green or not. There is a technical expert group from the civil society okay. who is working, Good. who are, well, who represent the financials. Well, I mean, you know what? You, I believe that at the end, at the end of the day, the that will be uh, decided. On the relative power of France versus German, Germany. Okay, uh, I'm not sure I that. The, 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 I the don't comment on it. <laughs> okay, same thing. So next step. So so in Germany, people believe that nuclear industry is is wrong. Okay, but also they believe gas, natural gas, is green. Okay, well, that's 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 interesting you know, because nuclear do not emit any CO2, whereas gas emits CO2. Uh, 
but, but it's true that at the same time, substituting coal by gas, as I said earlier, it's green because when you, when you want to produce one kilowatt hours, uh, if you do it with coal, you produce twi at almost twice as much CO2 as when you do it with gas. So it's, it's dynamic, it will be dynamic absolutely. Now, exactly. Okay, and yeah. then it should change. Maybe well, that would be included. Okay. So let me, I see, you are right. You are right. But that we are economists, okay? We are finers like those guys. Uh, so, I mean, so that's we not need. what I said, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Have to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we know that we still need coal, we need we need oil and gas. And, and after all, I would not be here now if I couldn't use my car to come back from Monaco this morning. Not my car, my friend Ted car. Um, <clears throat> so 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 we need saying to the financial industry, we should stop financing the oil industry right now, which is exactly what this. Uh, what it is uh, discussed right now, I mean, it makes no sense. Uh, um, so, I, what you know, what I propose, and uh, the problem is that I'm, those hedge funds and, and financial industry probably they are they do not understand what I say. Let me say it again. Uh, so, I propose that so plan A is let us put a price on carbon. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let us. Who is able to do that? Only the state are, is able to impose a, a, a price on carbon. So, so that's that's currently not politically acceptable. Let us, yeah, uh, that's my last uh, last idea that I want to develop. Uh, so let us go to Plan B, and Plan B, let us try to duplicate Plan A. That is, let us let us suppose that uh, let us try to convince the the financial industry. To, to do what, in fact, many industries already do, which is an internal carbon price. Okay, Total, Microsoft, uh, uh, ExxonMobil, uh, uh, Shell, they already use a carbon price, implicit carbon price, when, when they have to make uh, strategic decisions, but also day-to-day -day decisions in the company. They use an implicit carbon price. Why not, why not asking banks, hedge funds, you know, uh, uh, Margin the entire financial industry to use a, an, an implicit an, or an internal carbon price to evaluate their portfolio. Okay, that that would duplicate what the state, what the government has not been able to do, and and so that would be a much more clever uh, substitute to the taxonomy, which is uh, zero one, make no sense, and also much more sensitive because. Different companies could decide to use different internal carbon price. Okay, and they just need to say to the public, okay, we we decided to optimize your portfolio on the basis of this uh, carbon price, and maybe that company used 50 euros per ton of CO2, and that other other bank would use 100 euros, and then the customers decide uh, what uh, what uh, what the edge fund to select. So that's that's what I propose. I think this is just what uh, Enel has said, has done uh, one month ago. They issued a sustainable linked bond. Enel, the Italian uh, uh, gas provider. Gas provider yeah. yes. And they stated that by 2030, they should curb by 70% the GHG. If they don't, they put a premium of 25 bips onto the onto their bonds okay. on it, and this is not well. This is only one company. Danone has also done it with the B Corp uh, certification, but it's a bit starting on the, the market. And the market is uh, yeah. But what I propose is not the industry to do it. I mean, not not the not the petroleum company to do it. It's, it would be for the banks and the insurers and the hedge fund to do it they, when they decide to. To, to provide loans and capital to uh, through equity or bonds or whatever, they would evaluate the um, mm -hmm. the company taking the account of that price. Okay, and if they use a price of a price of carbon which is larger than 40 euros per ton of CO2, the consequence is that the the coal industry will be dead because they will realize that the cre value creation of those companies is negative when they take into account the implicit emissions of CO2 generated by the, the product they, 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 they 
Maybe on the role of, of regulators and the public pressure and plan A versus plan B. So indeed, um, these criteria are, uh, so people have in mind that indeed there is an issue with the carbon or with the grown energy. And indeed they are supposed to price it already, take it already in the price. But the question is, do they price it correctly? That is one point. And the second one is relative to the, to the, to the pressure and the, the political pressure, but there is also public pressure, I would say, given that, in fact, the move towards uh, sustainable invest investment is going on, in fact. People are taking these criteria to in, in, into consideration to invest. If you have a look at the, at the, at the figures, you see that 40% of products are marketed to investors in the uh, to have a climate or an ESG component. So it is occurring. It's not just, uh, I would say, a public or political pressure. It is taken into account by investors. So what to do with respect to that? So you make uh, the information accessible, at least. You have to know, as an investor, what are you investing on? Are you really investing on green products? Is it just greenwashing? Is it just uh, a sticker that it's put on the, uh, on the on the product? So these are the first action that has been taken at least. Yeah, Kera. Uh, so I was talking to uh, Monegas billionaire yesterday, mm -hmm. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they were having, "Do we make money on those on those investments?" Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so so. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think, exactly as the yellow vest uh, here in the street of France uh, had the concern about their, the, the, their own end of the month uh, before the end of the world, I think that, um, that uh, people who save their money and invest in, uh, in, in, in uh, hedge fund and things like that, they, 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 they probably care about, they, they certainly care about climate change. Uh, but uh, it's still an open question mm. to determine whether they are ready to give up some of the return of their portfolio mm. of their saving mm. in order to save the world. Mm. There are some uh, papers on that, actually, uh, experimental papers. Uh, uh, yes. The center. Uh, yes, yes, I know, I know it. Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. I, I've seen and it. The uh, uh, yeah. the so, so, it's a little bit. Uh, okay. So, and, and in, but still, uh, you are right. I mean, there, there has been an evolution in the way those hedge funds uh, or ISR funds uh, present their product. In the, uh, Sebastian and Sophie and Catherine, we, we witness in, uh, we have been witnessing that for how much time now? 12 years or 13 years? Uh, the, the, it, 13, 12 years ago, uh, most uh, SRI fund would say, oh, we beat we beat the market. Right? Our objective is to beat the market. Mm. Okay, uh, and now the, the 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 presentation of their product is different. They, they talk a lot, and that's great. They talk about their impact. Mm. Okay, mm. and that's new. I mean, uh, twelve years ago it was oh no, oh, well, yes, we do something for the planet, mm. uh, and that's good. And there is also a, a change in the in, in the paradigm on how to choose investment. We have gone from a negative screening on I don't want to have brown energy or whatever product in my portfolio, to looking for more positive for a more positive screening and getting uh, stocks or whatever uh, financial instruments that foster sustainable finance. Negative screening such as exclusion that narrows your portfolio mm -hmm. and increases your volatility. And yeah, and, uh, and I completely agree with you, meaning that uh, exclusions, I think, is the first step of uh, any political, uh, sustainable okay, politics, but it, it's, uh, it has to be taken off. Um, but risk management, on the other side, which is maybe the, the second step uh, on it, is just identifying the risks and just pricing them and just ex excluding them but uh, well I'm, I'm not Guillaume, I'm not against exclu exclusion strategy I mean, if if as I believe it we should put a price of carbon at 50 euros per ton of CO2 I know that excluding coal from your portfolio is a good thing to do I don't you don't need to make the computation I tell you you, you, you will obtain that result from putting an internal price on carbon at 50 euros per ton of CO2 and and also 12 years ago, yes, I should. Earlier, you said that you believe that the investment will not be impactful because there will be carbon in cage. So what you mean is that 
it should be a, a policy that is imposed on everybody no. uh, across the all investors so that if they all divest then there will no there will be no leakage by well, that's that's Unless that's some private companies are out there yeah, that's that's the same thing that for Plan A. For Plan A, it would be better if we would have a larger possible co co coalition of ambitious countries. It's also for Plan B. It's also better if we have more a larger fraction of financial market around the world to adapt to adopt that kind of strategy. Um, so, 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 yeah. so, so divestment is part of the solution in this Plan, plan B. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, at the end of the day, you. Yeah. We, by putting a price of an implicit price of carbon or an internal price of carbon in all hedge funds at 50 euros per ton of CO2, they will just stop financing coal. One good example country. of, of the impact of this type of divestment, I think, is the Aramco uh, IPO, mm -hmm. which uh, I think has been much more quiet uh, and less aggressive than, that, than what they wanted to do. Uh, so uh, it's not. Yeah, really I'm not right. sure. It's that's not, a good it's example. Not going, no, no, exactly, because it's not going to really stop. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, the, Saudi Arabia from, the fact uh, that. Well, it's a sad story. I mean, the fact that uh, Ara uh, Saudi Arabia is not able to diversify the eco their economy, it's a, it's a very sad story. It's a failure of, it's a failure of the of the system that we do not allow one one country to diversify, and that's exactly. their, their, their destiny is to. Uh, to go back to the sand, uh, yeah, because, it's, it's too bad. It would be better to have an uh, IPO that works exactly. at, a, at a lower price. This is uh, why you see that economists are very subtle, because in fact, you think that it would have been much better to have actually supported the IPO in order to give a lot of resources yeah. to Saudi yeah. Arabia for, for it to invest in, uh, in yeah, that's, that, that's exactly, yes, you're on, you're on paper. I yeah, mean, we, we, we would like to have product where you can diversify. Yeah. You allow this people to share this with each the, other. Yeah. And that's what we just say. On, on the government uh, public policies. This is putting a lot of trust on the Saudi Arabia governmental policies. I have a question for Sonha. Mm -hmm. um, so you say that the MFG so is trying to uh, induce investors to invest more in more green assets at the same time you care about greenwashing so we know that uh, for certified green bonds for instance investors are ready to pay a premium in order to invest in these bonds uh, do you think that so if there is a bias because there is lots of demand currently um, do you think that corporations are extracting a rent from the, from this investor and what is the view on the yeah, on investor protection um so the idea is really to 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 make this product transparent so in fact a, a label is under discussion also for the green bond so it's still uh, it is part of the plan of the european plan that uh, that i i, I uh, exposed um so for the moment uh green bonds are expanding but not that much um and the idea is really to make sure that uh, investors have all the information they are supposed to have to uh, to uh, have to make their investment. So the idea is really to make market as transparent as possible to know exactly what they're investing in. What is great uh, in in this time is that you know we have those information about the uh, emissions of CO two mm -hmm. by um, all uh, public pu public assets. Uh, and that's create new opportunities. Okay, it took it took five centuries to create a common accounting system to just evaluate the financial performance of mm -hmm. company. Now we have this window to also measure another uh, another uh, performance of the comp of, of companies it is emissions of CO two. Uh, it will take time, of course, to to make that credible and, and and to see that we need to put a value on this extra financial performance in mm. order to make things comparable with the purely financial performance. But 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 things are there. I mean, it, it's a, a unique event in the history of financial market for the last 200 years. The problem is that climate change is the only example currently available on the self for, uh, you know, doing uh, ESG, ESG things. Because, you know, if, how, how could we do the same thing for the S and the G? I mean, mm. how can we quantify these other things? Uh, we still are in the, in the blue. Uh, <coughs> 
which is fortunate because uh, yeah, yeah. this is one of the most global and uh, <laughs> damageable uh, groups. Yeah, and the trade-off today between uh, financial return and S and G is much more in favor in in non favor of the financial return yeah. rather than when one uh, to find a, an environmental friendly investment that uh, has a high yield. You know, there is a, uh, there is a difficulty with this uh, this uh, global movement on, on green or ESG and on green finance. I, I don't know what to call it, which is it's quite strange to see that. The, the, the public seems to be in favor of a system where rather than asking the democratic system to determine what is good and what is bad, we are currently moving with this green finance stuff and ESG stuff in a situation where we are promoting the idea that financial market should be able to say what is good and what is bad. And, and that's quite strange. The questions from the, from the audience? I would. Sorry. Following up on this and on your on uh, Christian proposal, um, some A or some B. Sure. Again, the, you know, plan B is supposed to replicate plan A. Which yeah. is very, uh, <laughs> so I was wondering if you uh, have a view on so if you let asset manager. So let's say that now we we try to implement uh, plan B and we let asset manager choose and we advertise the the implicit plan we are using. What would you think about competition there? Would they compete and will lower the tax, or some will uh, we specialize on some clients which uh, like to have a high tax, at maybe at expense of return? Uh, well, I, I well I don't know the preference of the of the representative investor here, and you know markets are good to find uh, to find the, the value on the market. Uh, so I. Uh, probably, I mean, yeah, maybe in the long run, all hedge funds will converge to the same common price. Maybe not. Maybe there will be niche of uh, of uh, SRI fund that will be uh, uh, you, that will be using a behind their carbon price, and they, and that will be available for the bobo. <laughs> uh, and, and other uh, SRI fund that is that is more common for the other uh, other fraction <laughs> of the public. Uh, I, I I have no idea. I, in fact, well, that's why we need to, uh, to continue this research on, on in the experimental research on uh, on uh, estimating the heterogeneity with the evaluation of uh, and also there yeah, and, and there are probably uh, some uh, theoretical research to be done there when people have. Preferences that are different in these two into these, these two dimensions: the yeah, the consumption the and and being good for the environment. We have a PhD student Paul Ardimoisson who is working on this issue. Yeah. 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 Okay, I have a plan B question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, because there's also a reason why we have plan B, right? Because plan A is 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 politically not feasible, right? I mean, even if the carbon price is so uh, to the market of 40 euros a ton. This would still be coal in Europe. Right? There has been coal in Germany when coal was completely unprofitable, right? because there's employment interest, there's political mm -hmm. interest uh, uh, supporting this. And that's why we are in Plan B. Right? We're also thinking about Plan B because Plan A is politically not feasible. So, my Plan B question is to, to Guillaume, uh, going back to uh, what you had like the physical risk. right? So, I mean, I thought you talked mostly about uh, the transition risk and the asset side of the of a score, but you're a reinsurer, right? And you're in the midst of actually financing climate risk. And the question is, if you're actually going to a six degree scenario, a, what is your internal discussion about what happens if this climate risk gets out of hand and at some point it can become in, uninsurable? A, a, of course, there's one reaction to say, okay, just the insurance premium go up and it's just a price for it, and then we can still insure this. But there might also be a situation when we get just market failure because there's no longer insurance market because it just becomes unpredictable. And to what extent does this kind of thing, like the climate risk, become so you know a systematic that the, the insurance market breaks down, the reinsurance market breaks down, something that is a a plan B dimension, right? Sort of like the financial sector needs to face this because you're only communicating with insurance companies that are relying on you and reinsuring them that at some point there is no longer a market. That is, like, is this yeah. part of the equation already in your thinking? Uh, it's a very good question because when we're talking about risks, risks are associated to a probability. We are not sure. 
when something is, is sure, you can't insure it. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a, a four or six degree scenario, and then that uh, you have floods every year, then you won't be able to, to insure it because we will know for sure that there will be uh, a flood. Uh, this is why former CEO of AXA said, I think that over four degrees, if I do remember well, uh, the world is not insurable, meaning that we don't have the tools today to insure it and to, to face chronic hazards or new uh, risks that, that we don't know how to. Just increase the premium. Well, yeah, the premium. if you're changing the paradigm, and I'm not on the. Yeah. yeah. Is, is there always a price? Mm -hmm. For example, in the market, that's great to sell. Sure, but we don't know for the time being. A lot of things that today are insurable won't be insurable to, uh, to, uh, tomorrow. But I mean, it's mo much more on the underwriting side that, uh, that is not my, uh, my specific point. Um, then, if you're moving to four, five, or six degrees, you have uh, this slide. Um, you have the consequences which are the tipping points, uh, the, tipic, the tipping climate change points, uh, meaning that you have kind of a domino effect with new risks that, that are emerging, such as, such as this one uh, that you see on the, on the screen. And this is a complete example that uh, I have no answer to tell you uh, what would be an, an insurable or not insurable. And uh, I think I might have uh, answered to a few questions. But the notion of uninsurable is part of the discussion. Well, I'm not an expert of, on the underwriting side. Um, so I can't say it for sure. It's interesting to see that uh, in California this week, they decide to, bl to freeze the, the, the price of, for the catastrophic risk on the, the Californian market. Because they, after the fire uh, last year, the insurer wanted to increase the, the premium, saying it's climate change and, and that will be there, it will be there for long. So we need to, in, to increase the price, the premium. And the state decided, no, you cannot do that. And therefore, you have this. Uh, they, 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 they don't insure now. Yeah, exactly. But that's a, that's a typical problem in the US. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. where the, the state needs to provide the subsidies to uh, sure. customers yeah. and things like that. <laughs> Like the funny mail of the insurance fund. That's what we have in this system. Yeah, so even if Marie Briere just wanted to respond, you kindly reminded us that it's almost 5.30, but we are going to take a last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, Norfolk, for your question. No one mentioned the climate migration. Maybe that will be the first order as a major risk. Yeah. You know, climate change has a myriad of consequences. And, and, and the models we currently use are very bad in, in most of those dimensions. Uh, in particular, this migration problem is very hard to estimate. In part, uh, and be also, because we don't really know where where the, the largest vulnerability are on this planet, uh, if they if they are in the poverty in, in the area of poverty, uh, that's where we will have a big big problem. Well, so uh, thank you very much for again for participating, and uh, and uh, hopefully we are going to have uh, other uh, conferences for this TSC uh, Sustainable Finance Center in the future, and uh, and and we hope to uh, to see you all uh, there. Thank you very much for participating.